So we're here with Thomas Abraham from Samsung. We're out in Bangalore, is that right? Yeah, Bangalore. So Thomas, I know you're assigned to the Kernel Working Group, but I don't know what you did before. What, what did you work on before coming to Lenaro? Yeah, uh, earlier to Lenaro, I was with the Samsung uh, kernel, Linux kernel team. Ah, really? Yeah. Were working on the kernel already before as yeah, well? Yeah, before as well. So basically developing the Linux support for Samsung SOCs, the S3C, S5P, and then the Exynos. Right. And uh, uh, some amount of customer support as well, with based on what requests we used to get from the customers. And then moved into the Linaro when Samsung joined the Linaro organization as well. So from then onwards, it's been in the kernel working group. Right. So uh, Deepak always raves about how much great work you've done there around device reporting, and um, that, that's basically what you've been focusing on when you're here, right? Right. Yeah, it's basically, uh, my main focus has been device tree, but there are other components as well that uh, in, in the kernel working group that we did for uh, Samsung platforms as well. Right. Like the KXX support we tested, we did some pin mux, uh, pin config uh, uh, right. driver support as well. So right. there are other things also that came up parallel and we used to do that. Right. So tell me more about device tree. Why is device tree a cool thing? Yeah, the device tree, uh, basically uh, we have, a, as Linus calls it, it's a bloat in the ARM kernel. Right. So we, uh, device tree is a mechanism by which we can cut down that bloat to a certain extent, to a large extent in fact. Right. By moving out all the platform specific data and the register definitions, interrupt definitions out of the kernel code in you know, for the platform kernel code into the device trees. Right. So that the kernel can become a bit more leaner and can boot on multiple boards. Right. So uh, and the amount of bloat that is going on into the uh, kernel can also be reduced. Right. And uh, uh, and I think going forward that is the approach that we are going to follow for most of the for new for, for newer platforms. For newer to near ARM based platform. Yeah, I've heard Art say that, that all new platforms have to be device tree enabled, right? Yeah, that's true. And uh, I think uh, there is, uh, there, is, there is, I think it's an accepted rule now that legacy way of doing things will not be accepted anymore. Right, right. So you've done work on device reporting for Samsung, right? So right. on the Exynos. Right. Um, so what, what does that mean? Like well, when, when you're actually doing the work, what, what changes do you have to make in, in, in the right. board files and initialization and so right. on? So basically, uh, the first step that we do is, uh, we find that there is a lot of uh, data that we have to pass to a driver from the platform board file, basically. What sort of data? Uh, for example, the GPUs that are used, the configuration settings for, let's say, an HDHCI uh, uh, right. driver, uh, uh, slave devices that are connected to an I2C bus. These are all static data mm -hmm. that is currently part of the kernel. Right. The idea of device tree is to move out of this, move out these data from the kernel into a device tree file and get it at runtime right. from the device tree. So, uh, so we can just now imagine how much of data that we are trying to dump out of the kernel, take out of the kernel and move into the device tree. So the approach we usually follow is uh, we modify our uh, initialization routine. The main changes happen in the driver's probe function. Okay. So when we probe, we get a pointer to the device tree node mm -hmm. and there are a bunch of APIs in device tree that are already upstream, okay. which help us read the data from the device tree and uh, pass it on to the driver. Right. So the bulk of the changes happen in the probe function of the driver. So uh, after getting the data and, and then one, we maintain support for legacy platforms as well. We don't break anything when right. we do these changes. We maintain support for both non-DT as well as DTKs. Right. And once the data is passed on to the driver, the driver behaves as if it booted out of a normal uh, platform support, platform data that it got from, from the uh, legacy support. So. Uh, the main changes happen in the uh, probe function. So it's mostly for a device initialization. Once the device is initialized, it doesn't actually need to read so much for the device tree afterwards. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we don't have to do any other changes. So now, one so of the things that I think... Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, so the main challenges that we face here is uh, when we start off, uh, the drivers might not be suitable for device tree additions in the first place. Why? Because, uh, for example, one example I can give is the, uh, the device ID. Yeah, uh, that we pdev of dot id that we use for doing certain weird things in the driver probe. Uh, based, let's say if it's instance zero, we do something. If it is instance one, we do something else. So those things, there is no, there is no such concepts are not supported in DT. There is no instance id as such in DT. So first of all, we clean up all those things, and uh, there are some 
function pointers that we pass from platform data. Right. Uh, that is no more possible when we move to the DT support. Okay. So uh, taking out, modifying our drivers so that we don't need any more function pointers is also something important. The first step I believe is the challenge that we have to make the driver ready for DT. Right. And once that is done, then the second challenge is to uh, decide the bindings. What are the bindings that we are going to come up with so that it can be supported for multiple platforms? not just single platform as such. Right, so if you have like, I don't know, a GPIO controller or GPIO what? controller, SDMC driver, SDMC driver has to support, um, let's say, 10 chips uh, going ahead and 10 chips that we already have. Right, and so we, have, we need a very flexible binding for all these things. So uh, that's the second thing. And uh, once we are done through that, we have a fairly good idea about uh, what needs to be done in the code. Right. So the designing of the bindings is the most difficult step. So device tree, once you start using it, you've, you've pulled all the static data out of the kernel into this file, which is separate, and you compile it into a DTV, right. which is this binary blob. Right. So one thing that changes as well is the initialization step, right? Because today the bootloader sets some things up, right. and then it you know, specifies a machine ID right. to the kernel, right. and off it goes. Right. And how, what's, what's, what's gonna, how is this supposed to be in the new world? Yeah, in the new world, basically, uh, we uh, there is no more uh, ATAX based. There is no ID or such anything. No machine ID. No anymore. machine IDs. Uh, there is a, we there is a compatible field that we pa pass from the DTB file into the kernel, and the kernel matches that and and then boots a particular board. Right. There's no machine ID, but there are there are some talks going on about adding machine IDs as well into DT to support multiple DTBs attached to the kernel. Uh, I mean, appended to the kernel. Tell me more about this. So, so the, what's the, what, what problem is that supposed to solve? Yeah, basically, there are we sometimes the problems are the U boot design is not upstreamed, right. and uh, there is no DT support available in U boot. So the only way. Or it's an old bootloader. It's a very board which is already shipped. Right. It's a very old bootloader with no DT support. And you can't modify it. You can't modify it. Right. And uh, so the only option that would be left is append the DT. Uh, uh, DTB blob yeah. to the kernel image so yeah. that the kernel boots off without any support from the U boot. Right. That's one option, and other option is like uh, we have we have one kernel image that has to boot on multiple boards. Let's say there are multiple OMAP boards that, and so for that we can append multiple uh, DTB blobs of different boards to the kernel, yeah. and then the kernel picks up one of them depending on the board ID that it got from the U boot, uh, and then continues from there. So it still gets the machine ID from U boot. U -boot. But then the kernel in the beginning decides, oh, I'm going to actually use this DTB right. here because it's the right one for this machine. Right. Right. So there are cases where there is talk going on on that, uh, but I think that will involve certain amount of work uh, to be done to get some support for that in mainline. Right. Uh, yeah, but uh, let's see. I mean, uh, b uh, that is also one of the areas that I think some people are working on. All right. Well, Thomas, thanks very much for your time. I yeah. appreciate it. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. thanks a lot.